Paris Perspective. Hello and welcome to this edition of Paris Perspective with me, David Coffey. Well, this month marks the 40th anniversary of France's abolition of the death penalty. In October 1981, France struck capital punishment from its statute books. So to look at this momentous occasion and have a look back at the last 40 years since the abolition of the death penalty here in France, I'm joined by Amnesty International's president here in France, Cécile Coudreau. Cécile, you're very welcome to the programme today. Thank you very much, David. I know I caught you a little bit on the hop today, but what I think is very striking about this, we're looking at October 1981, when France finally took the guillotine off uh, its statutes. Um, But France was the 36th country. But tell us about the process that started in the 1970s that Amnesty International spearheaded at the time that brought France to that point to actually strike capital punishment from the books. Mm -hmm. It is true that it is interesting to note that Amnesty International, for the first time, I think, went further than international law itself, Mm. because international law does not prohibit uh, capital punishment for the most serious crimes. But we had a lot of debates internally, and as you know, it's also an internal democracy, Amnesty International. So we decided in 1977 to call for an international conference in Stockholm, which led to the famous declaration of Stockholm. And for the first time, the objective of universal abolition of death penalty was really uh, our our motto. Mm. And it became a long, long battle, as you know, more than 40 years today. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to go further than international law in the sense that our interpretation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that everybody has a right to life and nobody should uh, suffer cruel, inhuman and um, degrading uh, treatment. So for us, this comes into play because it is definitely our definition of death penalty. Mm -hmm. So it was only natural, even though it was not so easy at all, (laughs) to to agree that this should be our objective. And indeed, we're looking back to the 1970s. Uh, I think you you, you mentioned this, like, you know, this was back at the, when really at at a changing point in the European Union, where it was really developing into what we now know as the Union. It was the EEC back then, the economic community, the European economic community. France was the 36th state to adopt the abolition of uh, the death penalty. Who were the trailblazers? Who were the ones who first put it on their books or struck it from their books? The very first was the Republic of San Marine. Then it was followed by countries like uh, Denmark, for example. So in a way, I have to admit, being French myself, that there is nothing to be proud of, Mm. actually, even though we are today very proud of what Robert Badinter and, of course, François Mitterrand achieved Mm. in a specific context. If we have a a kind of... uh, um, overview of the world. There is nothing prou- to be proud of when the country where the Declaration of Human Rights and the citizen <laughs> was adopted well, such is... a long time before. It's not really a great achievement well, to, to be did... the 36th. Well, why did it take 30 years? I mean, the Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations back in 1948. Then now, the okay, 33 years later, or 30, you know, France then struck, struck the death penalty from books. Why did it take so long? It's kind of paradoxical because on the on the one hand, we're also the country of enlightenment, you know, with people like uh, Voltaire, for example, were really uh, adamant to have this uh, penalty uh, abolished. And yet, every time, for the same old reasons, if I may use, this, use the expression, like a, a horrible murder, mm. it happened, for example, at the beginning of the 19th century and again the 20th century. So every time there was a big debate that could have led to the abolition, something much more emotional uh, became more powerful in that than, than reason, mm. even though they were supposed to be the country of enlightenment. Uh, so uh, that's why it took so long. And of course, we have also to bear in mind the uh, influence of such authors as uh, uh, Camus, Albert Camus, sure. for example, uh, Victor Hugo before him, of course. So it is a, a kind of paradox that we have on the one hand a tradition, a very long tradition of uh, abolitionists, mm-hmm. and on the other hand um, a population that was deeply attached to a, publish- to a punishment that is really in the spirit of an eye for an eye. Yes. So I don't know how much religion um, uh, took part, if you like, in, in this... Uh, 
um, kind of, uh, yeah, an obstacle, if you like, for, for abolition. Yeah. But it is mainly, I guess, related to uh, terrible murders, especially when it is children mm. after kidnapping, things like that. Usually it is uh, the only answer that people have in mind or in their heart, I should say, yeah. revenge, much more than justice, actually. A time to kill. It's yeah, basically, yeah. it's the, the last comes up. But uh, again, at the time, back in the 19, early 1980s, if I'm not wrong, I think two thirds of the French population were still very much in favour of it. Absolutely. So what was the defining, what were the defining points and arguments that were made that actually swung that two thirds back? The, the, the usual arguments like uh, the, the uh, illusion that it is going to deter other people from committing crimes, even though we have so many statistics today that mm. prove the opposite. It has nothing to do, in fact, with the death penalty, the uh, increase or decrease of a number of crimes. It is also a sense that if you want to find peace again, you need this kind of they would call that justice, but yes, for us, again, it is revenge, so it is definitely an illusion. And also the belief that it could protect society much more, because when people are sentenced to jail, even though it could be 20 or 30 years, people are afraid that they will do it again when they are released. So it is an, another argument that, of course, Robert Badinter uh, tried to and succeeded in uh, uh, countering, saying that if these people, and he took two or three examples of people who had been sentenced to death because they had uh, committed horrendous crimes, if they were in jail, what kind of danger would they represent for society? Mm -hmm. So he tried to destroy one argument after the other. And because he could feel this kind of uh, emotional and unhealthy attachment to death penalty, his attitude was, I think, very clever because he tried to make this punishment as concrete, as real as possible, not only an abstract concept of punishment, sure. but the reality of the blade. Mm -hmm. That's the metaphor he used, mm -hmm. the, the sound of the blade cutting into a man who is still alive. Yeah. And he said that to the jury. To each jury, he pointed at them saying, you are going to do this. Yeah. So it was a form of responsibility that maybe some juries and some citizens were not even aware of. Well, it, it, it hit an emotional nerve at the right, In a way, at the right time, the right yeah. place at the right time. Now, to play devil's advocate here, um, what, in, what are the arguments that are being put forward by, let's say, developed Western countries such as the United States in defence of keeping the death penalty? I think, I'm what afraid is it, it is going to be the same. I mm. think religion is uh, also yeah. very strong uh, So that, that, in, is, in a, that is a common thread when it comes yeah, to... Yeah, and we can also observe that southern states are even more attached to death penalty. That's mm -hmm. why we really said hooray when Virginia uh, abolished uh, last year. Sure. Uh, it was really a great sign that we could uh, try to establish a kind of positive dynamics, even in countries like, like this. So it is usually because of that, because of a form of uh, vision of justice, which is again... Um, uh, there is a confusion with uh, re revenge and also the same belief that if people have killed, it's not only God, but, that, but also men that should be um, responsible for protecting future uh, lives mm -hmm. by uh, killing, in fact, that person. And for Amnesty International, it is completely um, not only illogical, but un unacceptable, yeah. because for us, it is really the absolute negation of human dignity. So how can you protect human dignity? by denying it yourself, we really consider the death penalty as, as a kind of, uh, as I said before, cruel, human and degraded treatment, but also the opposite of civilization. Well, it's going backwards. Indeed, there are still 55 countries, I believe, in the world that have retained the death penalty, whether in law or otherwise, whether they are employed. Let's look at, like, I mean, we're looking at countries like China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, of course, the United States, as we mentioned there in various states. But let's look at China specifically. I mean, is there any glimmer of hope that the country that clocks up the most executions in the world will ever consider dropping capital punishment? So if I may, before answering that question about China, I have a little correction to make. It mm. is 55 states that haven't abolished mm. at all, but it is, in fact, 83 countries we have to convince because some of them have abolished in practice but not in Other law. Statutes. And as you know for Amnesty International mm -hmm. being based on international law we have to, to go as far as that. Yeah. Yes. So 83 yeah. countries even yeah. though in the reality yeah. 
only, if I may use the expression only, 18 states have really executed in 2020 gotcha. when we released our latest report. Mm -hmm. It's an annual report with statistics. So to come back to China, China is a big, big uh, problem. <laughs> problem for us, and it's international. Sure. The first issue is the issue of transparency. Uh, so we decided quite a long time ago now, I can't remember exactly the date, to uh, stop including China in this annual report I have just mentioned for a very good reason, because we had noticed that China not only was not revealing real figures, but also was trying to instrumentalize our report ah. and uh, was, uh, as usual, uh, doing a kind of... Uh, a distortion of facts, a kind of propaganda. So we didn't want to be instrumentalized. So we decided not to include them. But two years ago, we, we tried to publish a report only about China mm. to put as, pressure, as much pressure as possible on that country for more transparency. Because we think that when a country claims to be so important on the international uh, stage, you know, and wants to have an impact and influence, it is impossible. It is just incompatible with executing so many people. And when I say so many, I'm sorry to say I can't be specific because we you... know it is thousands and thousands mm. because we have tried to uh, use different elements um, to have a kind of estimate, but it is really difficult because it is a state secret. Yeah. So people who reveal uh, information about this could be punished, actually. Mm. So it is really a huge secret and it is the first step to be able to improve the situation mm. and also to improve the conditions in which uh, these people have been tried and then... Um, uh, when, when they are in jail, the kind of conditions they have to uh, endure, to live through, yeah. to endure. So all this is based on, uh, unfortunately, the worst element in China, which is a lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we are trying to, to, to continue our advocacy work, but it is particularly difficult in a country where the constant argument is no, um, you have no right, you know, to... to um, stick your nose to, into their Exactly, affairs. stick your nose, yeah. it would be maybe... Keep out of Xinjiang, yeah. keep out of Tibet. Uh, we, we're in charge, we know how to, uh, exactly. to look after yeah. our, our own population. Who are you to have a to pass a judgment on our country, etc.? So it is particularly difficult and challenging. Well, indeed, that brings me to my next question. I mean, you know, since 1981, since France has, um, you know, joined the other nations that abolished uh, the death penalty, um, what role have subsequent French governments played in pushing for the abolition of the death penalty in countries where it still remains. I mean, uh, stealing kind of a little bit of your thunder here, but I mean, is it a pillar of French diplomacy? Is the abolition I'm really important? I'm really happy you're asking the question because we are asking exactly the same question to mm. France, actually. Ah. For this 40th anniversary, we really want to push forward this agenda. It is absolutely essential that France, even though, as I said before, we shouldn't be so proud about this uh, mm -hmm. being the 36th uh, country only, but today we know that France's voice can be heard in different parts of the world. I was, I'm thinking particularly of Africa because of these historical links. And uh, we also believe that France could play a role in creating, again, a regional dynamics. Mm -hmm. For example, in Africa, it was Chad two years ago, uh, Sierra Leone uh, very recent, uh, it was last year, sorry, for Chad and Sierra Leone uh, only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So we think that if we can kind of set an example, mm -hmm. if we are exemplary, it is also possible to have a kind of domino effect and more and more countries can abolish. The same goes for democracy like uh, India or the US because or, or Japan. Mm -hmm. These three countries, I think, are really potential targets for advocacy work mm -hmm. because they want to be seen as a democracy, as a stronger and stronger democracy too, mm -hmm. especially India. So it could give us a form of leverage in, in, in France when we deal with these countries for other reasons, like uh, commercial reasons, for example, sure. to also put human rights in the picture yeah. and, and to try to push this agenda as much as possible. So we are asking today and we will throughout the year, France to do more, because it shouldn't be in the background, it should be really in the foreground. It should be in the foreground mm. of the diplomatic agenda for mm -hmm. France. Now, indeed, we're, you, you, you mentioned there on India, you know, Pakistan still has the death penalty also for homosexuality. I yeah. mean, it, it, they, they're, they're pretty... Uh, um, 11 countries do uh, execute really only because of homosexuality. So, I mean, th these are things, that, of course, for modern Western kind of progressive democracies that are, look like they're anathema. However, a question that I do want to put to you here is... How has the exponential rise in populism in Western democracies, be it in Europe, be it in the United States, mm -hmm. the UK, 
you you name it, it's very much a reality of its real politic of 2021. 20, uh, um, how has that impacted the abolition debate? Again, you're right. It, there is a link, definitely. Mm. I would say, first of all, there is a link with fear. Yeah. So populism, as you know, uh, even though we don't usually use that term, but everybody understands what we mean by populism, trying to play on emotion, trying to find... Fear, uh, deception, intimidation. Exactly. And it is not really a solution anyway. It is just an illusion of a solution that, that seems so simple that mm. people t tend to adhere, unfortunately. So populism and more particularly fear of terrorism, but also sometimes an instrument Instrumentalized fear of uh, migration, for example, that is associated to terrorism and to an increase in crime, but also crimes that happen, uh, unfortunately, even today uh, in, in democracies everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And also another um, element, which is not at all about Europe, but in Asia, for example, uh, I was thinking of the Philippines, but uh, Iran, etc. You have countries that um, uh, execute a lot in relation to drug crimes. Indeed. So instead of helping people who are uh, yeah. caught into the uh, the horror of drugs, yeah. in fact, they execute them, and sometimes it's mass executions. Sure. So it is particularly worrying in, in Iran, but also in, in the Philippines. They have um, threatened to come back to uh, death penalty because they have abolished death penalty, but Duterte yeah. regularly um, calls, and it is crazy but true, for kind of extrajudicial executions, executions. and it happens a lot. We, we, we uh, condemn that, of course course in the report and, and he's very proud of this as exactly well. this, is a, this is a pillar so of usually his yeah usually this kind of uh, issues um drugs uh and also serious crimes but also terrorism today are really instruments mm -hmm. to try to uh, push the population in the wrong direction so that's why we have to continue our advocacy work but also mobilization and sensitization mm -hmm. it is particularly important to rely on human rights education not only from France for example but mm -hmm. also on the regional and local level all around the world and that's why we are so happy to have so many sections all around the world today because it can increase increase our leverage, because very often people, uh, as you said about homosexuality, mm -hmm. I could add blasphemy, for example, Indeed. tend to reject arguments when they come from outside yes. their country, because they think it is a kind of rejection of their culture, etc., which is not at all the case. I mean, to be a universalist yeah. doesn't mean that you reject differences in culture. It means that you reject the fact that some people could be deprived of their dignity only in the name of culture. It shouldn't be instrumentalized in this way. So so when we have a lot of uh, uh, militants on the ground, you know, being able to organize debates, um, screening a, a movie and then having a debate or creating happening like a die-in, you know, when people yes. pretend to be dead in the streets, etc. And talking about it as much as possible through documentaries, through all kinds of uh, cultural events as well, this can make a difference because you can appeal to people's reasoning and not only emotions, yeah. even though sometimes emotion can also play a part, of course. Indeed, this brings me to my final question here to wrap up, maybe on a positive note, I think mm -hmm. it would be. It's like, um, like, which countries do you believe are now on the verge of scrapping the death penalty or state executions in their totality? And again, what are the incentives for countries to push through an abol abolitionist agenda? I mean, what are the carrots there yeah. and what are the sticks? I mean, and who is, who's getting there? Who, wh what advances are being made? We think that in uh, democracies, even though sometimes we could be tempted to add so-called democracies, like the US, mm. India and Japan, as I said, but also in many countries in Africa, it's a bit more difficult in Asia, mm. Uh, but we think that Japan, maybe in Asia, would be a, a kind of a, a, go, a good sign. Yeah, yes. a, a good sign. And usually the arguments are either because of advocacy work, because of uh, diplomatic uh, relationship, but sometimes economics <laughs> yes. also plays a part. For even, even though Amnesty International is not going to ask for sanctions on this kind of uh, basis, mm. w it is very rare when we ask for sanctions because it could be counterproductive for citizens themselves. So yeah. we, we usually don't. But we have noticed, for example, about 
of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. We managed to, uh, with a huge campaign, to to save two uh, a couple that were accused of blasphemy. But we were pretty much aware it was not only thanks to us and our campaign, but also because Pakistan was afraid of losing economic advantages with the U uh, European Union. Uh -huh. So it was a kind of mix of economic and diplomatic reasons that led them to save at least these two people yeah. accused of blas wrongly accused of blasphemy. And how did that manifest itself? Was it, were they, it wasn't like a, a Shia-Sunni sectarian divide. It wasn't um, apostasy or anything. What, it, were they, what were they accused it, of? In fact, they were accused of blasphemy and blasphemy laws are particularly uh, harsh, harsh in, yeah. in Pakistan. It is so easy to accuse somebody because sometimes you want to have a form of revenge because of another kind of yeah. uh, disagreement with them. And the, the minute you're accused of blasphemy, it is taken so seriously by the authorities. It's very hard to defend yourself. This couple, for example, were people who couldn't even read and write. Can you imagine? So were they denounced? Yes, they, they were, were denounced, denounced, absolutely. And we, uh, we, we organized what we call an urgent action. So all around the world, people started to write to Pakistan. And mm. exactly at the same time, it was a coincidence, the European Union Union, based on our own reports yeah. and uh, our documentation of this case, also put pressure from an economic point of view this time. So we believe, well, I know because of uh, an advocacy meeting we had at the embassy, mm -hmm. that these two um, elements really uh, had an impact on the decision to, um, to get not them, to execute, not them. execute yeah. them. I mean, it goes, it brings it back to 1431, Joan of Arc, who would not, who refused to recognize the authority of the church, and that's yeah. why she was burnt alive. So this is truly medieval yeah, things yeah. that are on statute books. Mm -mm. <laughs> But at least it gives some hope because yeah. we realize we can have an impact either on individual lives, yeah. especially with these urgent actions I was mentioning, but also we are really gaining ground. If you have a look at the whole world, when we started in 77, it was only 16 states that had yes. abolished. Today it is 108 for all um, punishments, yeah. and it is, as you know, 28 more for other crimes, what we call ordinary crimes. Yeah. So it is definitely going in the right direction. So we are very hopeful, especially when countries like the US, where it is not so easy, now it is 22 states that have abolished. So yeah. it is step by step. Step by step. We are state moving by state. In, in, exactly, yeah. state by state and <laughs> step by step. Taking off the boxes, hopefully. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> And just very, very finally, um, we have to look at Saudi Arabia. I mean, maybe an interesting thing about economics, carrot and stick, where their execution Absolutely. rate has gone down yeah. because they have now tried to open up to tourism. They were um, chairing the G20. Summit, uh, exactly. So it, did you, like, could you notice a Absolutely. exponential decline? Yeah, yeah, there were two signs. First of all, as you said, the decrease in the number of exec execution, but also a very important announcement. They yeah. said that they would stop executing people who had committed a crime when they were under 18. And this is something which is completely prohibited by uh, international law, even though, as I said, death penalty itself is not forbidden. It is definitely forbidden for people who are under 18 or people who have a mental disability. Mm. And the US, it is so shameful, continue to execute. At the moment, we have a petition about Rocky Myers. Mm. Please go to our website and sign the petition to save his life because he has big, big mental and psychiatric uh, problems. And yet he's going to be executed if we cannot save him. So it is typically the kind of situation where we know we can make a difference. So I really appeal uh, to everybody's uh, you know, capacity of indignation and action to do something about it because we are really having results. Year after year, the situation improves. So we won't uh, finish uh, until it is universal abolition. Universal of the death abolition. Penalty. Well, indeed, we're going to leave it at that, and it's no better time to sign up and get on board uh, on the 40th anniversary of the abolition of the death penalty here in France. Uh, Cécile Coudriou, President of Amnesty International here in France, thank you very much for being on Paris so Perspective today. And thank you for watching. We'll be back in two weeks' time. <laughs>